85 BC, Earth's time. Something magical had happened to a 15-year-old boy named Emery. A sharp ringing sound filled Emery's head as he opened his eyes. The moment the ringing disappeared he then noticed the blue sky and the colossal castle in front of him. He was at a loss. This castle was bigger at least ten times than the royal castle in the kingdom he belonged to. Not only its size, its spiral shape connected to arcs and other buildings with stones painted white, which seemed to radiate some light, were things he had never seen before even from the books he had read in his father's library. However, that wasn't only the strange thing. He swept his gaze from left to right and there were an uncountable number of young people that seemed to be the same age as him walking in rows toward a strange large tower. Emery didn't move, rather he was unable to move. The last thing he could remember was fire, destruction and death. He muttered to himself, am I dead? Father, where are you? He was contemplating when a booming voice called out to him. You. Move. Follow the line. Don't stop. Emery slightly jumped and when he turned around, the man wearing armor with intricate patterns of the color black and gold was pointing at him. The helmet also had a winged design, that covered the whole face except for the eyes, nose, and mouth, making a T-shape. It looked so luxurious that even the armor of Emery's king used to wear in special ceremonies couldn't compare. I said, move. Emery jumped again and started to walk following the person in front of him. What is happening? Emery said to himself. And since Emery had a habit of speaking to himself, another young fellow on the line next to him called him. Hughes T.E. Emery twisted his neck toward the direction of the voice and saw another young boy. He pointed to himself with a confused look. Emery asked, were you calling for me? Ida Vero, T.E. The young boy cleared his throat and changed his words, are you Britain? Emery had recognized the words the young man used. It was Latin. He had studied a bit of Latin, but it wasn't enough to make conversation with. Fortunately, the other boy spoke Emery's language with a strange accent. You're the first to understand what I'm saying. Do you know what happened or where are we, asked the boy, with short brown hair. I. I don't know, said Emery, shaking his head. It didn't take long before they arrived in front of the gigantic tower that seemed to stretch toward the sky looking from its feet. There were like thousands of people wearing the luxurious armor he had seen before and the widest staircase he had ever seen going into the tower. At the center of the stairs there were several men and women wearing gray robes. The man who had a long beard appeared to be the oldest stepped forward. Emery felt like he was looking at a giant despite the old man being the same size as his father. And the old man stomped his staff, and a voice sounded in his mind. Welcome to the Magus Academy, the old man said, not moving his lips. Tens of thousands of people reacted with surprise as they stared at the old man. The man then continued, you are the chosen few from the thousands of human worlds. Whether you take hold or not of this opportunity, it is up to you. You are at Magus Academy, the peak of humanity's ingenuity. Magic, science, and might is all available to those who seek it. The purple tower behind the old man, slightly lit after he had said those words. We are giving all of you seven days to study whichever you desire and after that, you will return to your respective worlds. If you are worthy and able to meet our criterias, Magus Academy will again be open to you once more. If you're unfortunate, then you will forget everything that happened in this place. Use your time wisely. I hope all of you are successful. After the old man finished speaking, he waved his staff and everyone felt a burning sensation in their left palms as if they had been stamped by hot iron. In Emery's palm, a circle with a line extending from the bottom to top formed and the ringing sound filled his head again. Not longer after, the burning stopped so did the ringing. Emery's ear peeked up as he heard the words around him. Magus Academy? We're at a place of learning, said a random guy. Am I dreaming? Emery realized he could understand the various languages around him. He was about to ask the boy who asked him before when a female voice entered his head. Everyone, gather according to your class and world. Focus your mind on the symbol in your hand. 
It was a strange request, but it wouldn't hurt trying it, would it? As soon as Emery did so, the symbol on his hand lit and showed various words. Emery. Male, 15 years old. Planet 1002, Earth. Magus Academy Class 77. Everything was truly like a dream. If this was the afterlife, then wouldn't his father be here with him? But no, he wasn't here. The only rational explanation was that this was a dream. Hey, you're class 77 and planet 1022? It looks like we're from the same world. My name is Julian, what's your name? said Julian, the boy who spoke with him before. I am Emery. This brown-haired man named Julian had an air of nobility from the way he carried himself and white clothes. He suddenly shouted, Who else is here from planet 1002 Earth? Emery could somehow feel this man was reliable. He had never seen Julian lose composure even once despite being in the same position as him. Emery approved what this boy was doing as well, it was quite smart to have the same people who came from their own planet, so that they could ask each other questions on what they remember before appearing here. Three young people came over to where Emery and Julian were, they weren't far away. The first person to arrive was a beautiful black-haired girl with brown skin. Second was another brown-haired boy who had an air of wildness. Lastly, a boy with slanted eyes that had his long black hair tied to a bun arrived. They all looked the same age, but it was clear as day they came from different parts of the world. Would the beautiful woman introduce herself first, said Julian, making a bowing gesture. I am Clea. Alexandria, Miss Sir. Oh, that's close to ours, replied Julian, smiling. He then pointed at the boy with slanted eyes and asked, You my friend. I know you're our friend from the east. China? The boy shook his head and said, Dongbayo. Chumo is my name. Wow, that's the easternmost area of? China. It's so far away. Emery recognized those names from the parchments he had read in the royal library. For Julian to be well versed in all this, Julian must be a high noble from where he had come from. The last boy, although still the same age as them, had a muscular build. He stepped forward close to Julian and said, I'm Thrax, a Thracian. Julian, you're a Roman, aren't you? That is right. I'm from Rome, replied Julian, standing his ground. Thrax came a little closer and said, Roman pig. Barbarian, said Julian. The joyful atmosphere became tense as Thrax and Julian glared at each other's eyes. Emery stood at the back, observing everyone. He couldn't help as well but get a strange feeling that despite their differences, they would all have a long destiny together. Little did these kids know, they would soon shape the history of their world. And they would become the Earth's greatest magi. Two days earlier. Tack. Tack. Emery's focus was at its peak as he intricately attached the last carved wooden figure on top of the box he had made. He had been spending months studying and working with their family scholar to give it to someone very special for him. The box clicked and Emery's eyes widened. Should it have clicked or not he didn't know. He lifted the small box and looked around. Nothing though seemed to have fallen. He then slightly tilted the box with his other hand ready to catch the wooden figure in case it dropped but it didn't fall. Slowly, he pulled down the lip of the box and the figurine descended into the box until it was closed, he opened it again and the figure ascended from the inside. Phew, it worked, said Emery, wiping the sweat from his forehead. He blew the lit candle beside him, which had dropped a lot of wax on the table. He didn't realize it was so late in the night when he had finished carving the small figurine. As he thought of the person receiving this gift, he fell asleep with a big grin on his face. Emery only had a few hours of sleep but still woke up just the right time next morning. He stood up, stretched. His body and mind was still urging him to sleep more, but when he saw the small box he had made last night on top of the table, he smiled because today was a special day. Her coming of age ceremony. On the hallway, he stumbled onto his father, Geoffrey, the head of the Ambrose nobility. Are you well, my boy? You look like you're still sleepy, Geoffrey asked. 
I. Uh, yes, said Emery, scratching his head. I know you're excited about the princess coming of age ceremony, but I need you to think about your body. You also need to practice later, and we'll have to leave by noon, said Geoffrey as he tried to rub Emery's head. Emery shook off his father's calloused hands and pouted, I'm not a kid anymore, father. Don't worry, I'll practice. Huh, whatever you say, you'll still be my little boy, said Geoffrey, grabbing Emery. Emery struggled but didn't have the strength to break free from his father's hug, he had no other choice then but to glare at his father's wrinkled face. Off you go now, my child, said Geoffrey when he let go of Emery. Every morning Emery spent a few hours practicing the sword with one of the family knights even though he had inherited the weak constitution of his late mother. Nevertheless, that didn't stop Emery from wanting to train. He wanted to be a knight and make his father proud. Emery slashed on the empty air with his thin arms. After a few strikes, however, he was already catching his breath and fell to the ground exhausted. He really couldn't fight against what destiny had given him, years he had been doing this but there was little to no improvement. Young master. It's time for your lesson, said the scholar. Okay. The student and teacher made their way to the estate's library. The room was filled with scrolls, parchments, even some herbs for the cauldron nearby. Here, Emery continued his studies by browsing the scrolls with the scholar explaining them. He actually found studying these scrolls much easier than sword fighting. He had been studying scrolls about crafting and architectural construction, which he found to be interesting lately. But the scroll on herbs and potion making from his late mother was his favorite topic of all. During his childhood, other than practicing and studying, he loved spending time in the woods. He often liked to find the plants and herbs his mother had written and experiment with it afterward. Emery also found the forest to be his safe space. Maybe it was because of how his father had told the stories of his late mother and how similar they were that he found the woods relaxing. He also never had been afraid of wild beasts, he felt the creatures of the forest were more like a friend unlike those other noble kids who loved bullying him for some reason. His father, however, had once seen him petting a wolf and chased it away. What transpired after were days of scolding on how dangerous the woods were from his father. Still, Emery snuck to the woods from time to time to make himself relaxed and enjoy nature. When the noon had arrived, Emery rose up with excitement in his heart, he took a quick lunch and after washing himself, wore the best attire he had. It was a leather jerkin made from a cow's hide with a white linen garment on the inside. He didn't want to wear it because it smelled a little but what choice did he have? It was the nicest looking clothes he had, all the other garments he had were tattered. He didn't have anything like those other higher-ranking nobles with their fancy, good-smelling clothes. Although the Ambrose family was the lowest-ranking nobles, ranking fifth among their peers. Emery never complained since he had a good family, good home, and food on the table. With fast steps, he grabbed the wooden box, put it in a pouch before going outside to the stables. The stable boy had already prepared the brown horses which he and his father would ride together. This is it. All is prepared, said Emery, double-checking his pouch. Emery couldn't wait to arrive in the estate of the lioness family, the highest-ranking noble in the kingdom and see Princess Gwen once more. The lioness estate had high wooden spiked walls placed in a circle to protect the elevated stone castle in the middle, a lot of commoners were moving around, entering and exiting the outside of the wall, guards were patrolling everywhere, the market's atmosphere seemed so bright and lively, unlike his family's estate. They soon arrived at the house of the lioness, which even had more grandeur because of today's event. Its high walls displayed a red cloth, accented with gold-colored linings and an image of a lion's head in the middle. The moment the father and son dismounted from their horses, a condescending voice called their attention. Well, 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 if it isn't the Ambroses, said a bearded fat man wearing a luxurious coat. Good evening, Fantomar replied Geoffrey with a slight bow. Emery was still dazed at the banner of the castle and the prospect to meet the princess that he failed to properly greet the noble in front of him. Fantomar clicked his tongue seeing such disrespect and said, a boy with no manners. You should teach him better, Ambrose. Yes. Forgive me. I will, Geoffrey said. 
Behind Fantomar was another large boy that appeared to be the same age as Emery and a head taller. He's smelly too, father, said the pig boy, pinching his nose. Don't worry yourself with such a lowborn, Abe, said Fantomar. Let's go, my son, before their smell sticks with us. Abe then smirked and issued a proud look before walking away with his father. Emery feigned indifference as he stared at the pig nobles, behind him however, he had his fist clenched the whole time. He and his father were being insulted but he couldn't do anything since his father had always reminded him not to make any trouble in front of such a noble. After all, the Phantomar nobility was the second highest ranking noble in the kingdom next to the king's family and was also the right hand of the king. Their statuses were worlds apart even if both families were nobility. Emery was smart enough to understand this. It didn't take too long for the other families to arrive, some rode horses but some also in their carriages at the castle's front gate. Soon, they entered the castle one by one. The hallway was large and had a lot of hanging decorations from varying colors of cloth. The walls had a lot of trophies, swords and shields, bows, spears, etc., showing how the king loved to hunt. In the middle of the room, a large table had been set and a feast of milk, mutton, bread, cheese, soup, vegetable, alesh, etc. Music from the trumpets and cymbals filled the whole palace while the curvaceous dancers entertained the guests mingling with each other. All the nobles stopped what they were doing and turned to the person who shouted. All hail his royal majesty, the first of his name, the fearsome hunter, his eminence, Richard the lioness and his daughter, the first of her name, Princess Gwyneth. The guests looked up on the main hall's grand stairs. Then, the king appeared wearing a coat filled with fur on its neck. The crown on his head showed an insignia of a standing lion. His amazing presence, however, was overshadowed by the beautiful girl descending beside him. Her silky golden hair bounced like a golden waterfall in the air while the emerald circlet highlighted her beautiful unblemished cheeks, tiny nose, and lips. The tight green dress she wore flowed smoothly from her chest down to the floor, displaying to the fullest her wonderful figure. Emery stood in awe with his mouth agape, staring at the beautiful princess. Then he realized the princess's gaze fell on him. She sweetly smiled at him briefly before looking down, watching her steps on the stairs. Emery's heart skipped. He looked to his left, right, behind, and below with a confused look but no one was there other than his father. Did she just smile at him? Emery couldn't help but scratch his head while feeling his face hot. The atmosphere became rowdy as the people raised their mugs and cheered for the princess coming of age ceremony. The feast began, the lively music reverberated around the great hall as the king took a seat on his throne. Princess Gwyneth stood beside the king and the nobles started to form a line to greet the king and his daughter. The line was in accordance with the ranking of the nobles, therefore, the Ambrose was the last to greet the king and the princess. All the nobles before the Ambrose presented expensive gifts. Jewels, necklace, circlets, etc. Especially the Phantomar, when the son, Abe, presented a chest full of gold and silver. The other nobles gasped on how precious the gift was. Unfortunately, the gifts presented to the princess seemed to have not moved her. That was until it was the Ambrose's turn. Emery and Geoffrey bowed before the king and the princess. Emery glanced at the princess and her eyes seemed to have lit up. He stepped forward and grabbed the pouch dangling in front of him but stopped. Geoffrey noticed his son's hesitation and said, We apologize that we are unable to provide a gift this time, our royal majesty and royal princess. We have had a tough year and thus do not have any worthy to bring out for your royal presences. Pfft, such poor excuse and disgrace commented Fantomar. It is fine, Fantomar, said Richard. He raised his hand and added, You are forgiven, rise and enjoy my daughter's special day. We are here, after all, to celebrate my daughter's sixteenth birthday. All praise be to you, my king, said Geoffrey, bowing once more before leaving with Emery. The two made their way to the long table and sat in the furthest corner. His father of course came as a respect to the king. In fact, it wasn't long ago that his father had once been a trusted confidant of the king. But it was a past that his father didn't wish to discuss. 
The feast began and everyone enjoyed the meals presented by the king. Princess Gwen broke off from her father and decided to greet the nobles one by one. She went by the order of the rankings of the nobles, of course, it was still up to her whether she would decide on greeting that family or not. Emery began eating his meal with a sullen face. He wanted to give what he had worked on for months, but when he had seen what the others had to offer, he had become embarrassed of what he was about to present. A wooden figurine of the princess, what a laughable gift. He looked up and found the princess mingling with the other guests. But again, Emery noticed she stole a glance toward his direction. Then finally, she seemed to have cut off her conversation with the other nobility and walked toward where he and his father were seated. Emery's heart began to pound as the beautiful girl made her way with her handmaiden behind. But from a corner, a pig appeared with his entourage and blocked her way. Good evening, lovely princess, Abe said. He bowed with his fat belly twisting and added, If I may say, your beauty is as wonderful as the stars that shine through the darkness of the night. Abe, how can I help you, said Gwen, ignoring the boy's remark. Emery grunted in his heart when this boy appeared. He seemed to have noticed but wasn't sure because of his dislike of the boy, but it felt like the princess' smile and mood turned sour. Her golden hair, green eyes, and white porcelain skin earned her the adoration of many, making her the jewel of the kingdom. Tomorrow was her coming-of-age ceremony and many of the nobles would come to visit her father's castle. Hmm, which one do you think suits me better? The white or the gold one? asked Gwen as she compared the two dresses the wooden mannequins were wearing with her emerald eyes. You are pretty in both dresses, my lady, answered her handmaiden. She sneakily rolled her eyes since that wasn't helpful. Gwen stood beside the mannequin dressed in white and said, I think the white one is perfect for me. What do you think? Yes, you are lovely in white, my lady, said another handmaiden. She switched positions and went to the other mannequin and said, at second thought, I think the gold one would look better on me. It highlights my eyes, right? Yes, you are absolutely right, my lady, replied the first handmaiden with a slight bow. Another bland answer. Whenever she asked for the other's opinion, all she would hear was praise. No one dared oppose her or gave their real thoughts unlike her mother, the late queen. She sighed as she took a seat and stared at the portrait of her mother hanging on the wall of her dressing room. Gwen bit her lips slightly wishing her mother was here, after all, tomorrow was her sixteenth birthday. And even though she was surrounded by a lot of handmaidens and a lot of people would come to see her, she couldn't help feeling more lonely. The door knocked and one of the handmaidens opened it. One more handmaiden came in and gave Gwen the news. She then rushed toward the king's study room. There were two men talking and one of them was the king but her purpose for going here was to see the other person whom her father was talking to. She jumped at the man and said, Uncle. There she is. My lovely niece, said Brett, returning her big hug. Brett was the younger brother of Gwen's late mother. He wasn't like any other nobleman who loved to stay in their fiefs, instead he loved to go adventuring across the Seven Kingdoms and even farther. He would usually be gone for months but his latest expedition had taken him almost two years. I miss you, uncle. Please tell me all your great adventures. Where did you go? How were the people? What did you s? Gwen stopped as she heard her father's cough. Brett laughed and said, Ha ha ha, hold your horses, my niece. I'll tell you all about it tonight. I'm actually here because of your special day tomorrow. Don't think I've forgotten about it. For now, I'd like for you to close your eyes. Hold out your hands, Brett said. As soon as she did, a rough but light item fell on her palms. Her eyes sparkled and saw the coarse, rolled-up parchment. Gwen unrolled it and stared at the drawing. Richard sighed and said, Brother, you're spoiling her again. I'm blaming you for her mischievous attitude. Please forgive me, my king. But she's the only remembrance the late queen has left us, said Brett with his fist on his chest. Gwen turned the parchment to the left, right, and somehow realized. She said, Uncle, is this? Brett smiled and said, Yes, smart girl. This is called the world map. This was first created in Greek, 
but now almost all places I've traveled to in Europe use it. Such a wonderful gift, uncle. Thank you uncle, said Gwen, hugging her uncle once more. This was one of the best gifts she had received in advance, which was even more precious than any of the beautiful dresses or jewels. Well, off you go now, I have some things to discuss with the king. I understand, uncle. But promise me you ll spend time telling me about your adventure. Gwen gave him a big smile and issued a ladylike bow before leaving. That night, Gwen enjoyed the stories of all the places her uncle had traveled to until she slept. And because of that, she dreamed about the different houses, the people, animals, and the world far far away. When she had awoken, all she could still think about was the dream and all the places her uncle had mentioned. In fact, her mind was even more occupied with those thoughts rather than her coming of age ceremony. She really wished to talk to someone about it and while getting ready, a noble boy came to her mind. She said to herself, yes. I am sure he'll be here today. The ceremony started and the moment she descended the stairs beside her father, her eyes immediately caught the sight of a boy who looked more like a commoner compared to the rest of the nobles in the area. She couldn't wait to walk over to him, but she must attend first to her duty, thus she was stealing glances at him. The gift giving ended as well as greetings. Now, she must attend to her duties. She went and greeted the other nobles by herself with her handmaidens behind. Gwen said to the last noble family she had mingled with, I hope you are enjoying yourselves. She looked once more at where the boy was and then added, Please excuse me. She made her way toward him but the son of her father's advisor, the Phantomar boy, blocked her path and said some cringy words. Gwen slightly furrowed her brows. She never liked this boy but as a respect to his family's status, she said, Abe, how can I help you? Your royal princess, I would like to. My apologies, but I can't talk to you right now, Abe, said Gwen when she saw the boy stood up and tried to walk away. Gwen walked straight to the boy and exclaimed, Emery. And without notice, she grabbed his arm and dragged him outside. That act surprised some nobles, especially the young noble, Abe, whom the princess had cut off and left for the lowborn boy. He was with her in the enchanting garden, the great view of the sea, the sound of the waves. The rays of the moon and stars reflected from the coast to her, making her beauty indescribable. Emery didn't want to let go of the smooth and soft hand of the most beautiful girl he had ever laid eyes upon. His heart thumped against his chest. The footsteps of the handmaidens and guards neared and Gwen released her grip on him. Princess Gwen? We could get in trouble. Oh come on, Emery. You don't have to call me princess. We'll be fine. Anyway, the ceremony is over and I felt like suffocating there. I needed a breath of fresh air. Please, will you accompany me please? Unbeknownst to her, Emery was actually more concerned about how he would get scolded by his father, but he couldn't possibly refuse a request by the princess, could he? Besides, the view here with the jewel of the kingdom, how could he say no to that? Give me one second. I have a surprise for you, said Gwen as she turned around. Surprise? It's me who is supposed to, Emery grabbed his pouch but Gwen wasn't listening to him one bit. She found what she was looking for and said, look at this, Emery. Is this? Emery's eyes shone, recognizing what Gwen took out from him. That's right, approved Gwen with a smile. This one below is called Africa. And the one on the farthest is China. It's like the story from Parchment we had read before. Emery and Gwen had known each other for quite some time now. When all the other kids were riding horses and hunting, Emery loved to spend his time reading. He had finished all the parchments and scrolls he could find in his father's library. So, whenever his father had matters to attend to in the lioness's castle, he always forced his father to let him come. He had spent a lot of time reading the various stories found in the royal library. And that was where he had often met with Gwen. Although they didn't often meet, they got along so fast probably because they had two things in common. The first was they both loved to study and read about the various history, places, and curiosity of the world, and the second was both of their mothers had died when they were young. Although much of it all thanks to the princess-friendly attitude. That evening, 
they talked for almost an hour about the places on those maps they had only heard in stories. I am sure you can. You are a princess, you can do anything you want, said Emery. Without realizing it, the princess's dream of exploring the world became part of Emery's dream too. Whether it was because he, himself, was interested in all the wonders of this world or because he would love to go on an adventure with her. Gwen turned her face on Emery with a big smile and said, that's very sweet of you to say. Thank you. Before turning dark and added, thank you again. I feel really great now that I have talked with you, you really are a good friend. Emery's heart slightly prickled. He liked her, but when he thought about it more, being labeled as a friend of the most beautiful lady in the kingdom was a fortune in itself. Maybe that was all they would ever be. He then realized he still hadn't given the thing he had worked on for months. Reluctantly reaching his hand into the pouch, he embarrassedly said, Gyuguen. I also have something for you. What is it? asked Gwen, tilting her set on the side. Emery handed out the pouch before pulling it back. He laughed. What's the hesitation? Is that for me? Thank you, said Gwen. What box is this Emery? Before she was able to open up the box, however, sounds of step got closer. Ehem, coughed a big man wearing a luxurious coat, two men walking toward them. Father, Sir Fantomar, said Gwen. Emery was shocked to see the king right next to him, and Fantomar the highest noble of the kingdom. Your Highness, exclaimed Emery, bowing before the king. The king recognized him. You are Geoffrey's boy, aren't you? Yes, my lord, replied Emery. I've heard many things about you from my daughter. The fat noble interjected, Your Highness, I suggest you stop the princess from playing with this boy. The Ambrose family was already at the bottom of the barrel, but Fantomar's pressing further by asking the princess and the king not to socialize with Emery was pushing it. Gwen stomped the ground and glared at the fat noble. Her voice had a sense of sharpness in them. Lord Fantomar, you may be my father's right hand but you're out of line telling me who I can and cannot be friends with. Fantomar furrowed his brows. This princess had always been a pain in the ass for their family. He turned to the boy instead and ordered, Boy, raise your head let us see your face. Emery, feeling brave because of the princess backing him up, raised his face and looked Fantomar directly in the eyes. Fantomar smirked. The light of the moonlight reflecting on Emery's eyes confirmed his suspicions. He wasn't sure when he had seen this kid earlier at the gate but now he confirmed. Do you see it, sire? The boy has his mother's eyes. What do you mean Fantomar, asked Richard. You see, sire. Fantomar leaned closer and whispered, he's a half-blood. Uh. A fey crutton, exclaimed Richard, staring at Emery's eyes. Fey crutton were humans who lived in the deep forested areas of the Britons. It was said that they loved to socialize with the mysterious creatures of the forest, the fey creatures. The fey crutton lived without following the kingdom rule. For hundreds of years, the Fey Crutton and the people of the Kingdom people had always been at war. The Lioness Kingdom's military had attempted to burn these forests multiple times just to drive out the Fey Crutton, but for reasons unknown, the fires never seemed to spread out. Thus, all sorts of rumors from the Fey Cruttons knowing black magic, witchcraft, mythical creatures, etc. began to spread. At this moment, another figure walked in. It was Geoffrey Ambrose, Emery's father. He didn't waste one more second and got down on one knee in front of the king. My liege, I apologize for the behavior of my son. I hope he didn't offend you in any way. I will discipline him better. The king stared at Geoffrey with a complicated look, he said, is what Fantomar said true? That your late wife, is a crudden? Geoffrey replied with a heavy tone, itit is true, my king. The king's face darkened his wrinkles appeared, fists tightened and mouth clenched. The Crutons were the reason he had lost his wife. He hated them with all his being. Emery also noticed how Gwen's face had changed. He still didn't understand what was happening. Everyone except him seemed to know what was going on. Gwen, come with me right now. 
Richard turned to the father and son and said a single word that was full of hate, leave. Father, I. Now, roared Richard. Gwen was startled. Her father had never shouted at her, this was the first. She looked at Emery with a complicated face and said, I'm sorry. I don't think we can be friends. Richard grabbed Gwen, prompting her to drop the box Emery had given, and dragged her back into the palace. Emery blankly stared at the broken box with figurine pieces on the ground. He was about to pick it up when the palace guard barred his way. They were then shown out of the palace. Once they were outside, the gates behind them were shut. Emery was at a loss as he gazed at the towering wooden gate wondering what did he do wrong? Why did the princess and the king look at him like that? He asked his father for answers, but all his father gave was a weak smile. The ride home was full of unbearable silence. Emery wished instead for his father to just scold him. Back at the palace, Fantomar watched the Ambrose father and son riding their horses. He deviously smiled on how they were now on the king's bad side. However, that wasn't enough for him.